Good morning and welcome to New Beginnings Coffee House Church. As we continue the study of the book of Luke, we're in chapter 20. I have to tell you, I am so enjoying studying the Gospel of Luke. I have never been this depth in a book before. As far as the Gospels are concerned, I've studied John pretty deep, but not verse by verse like this. Um, I've gone through the epistles all through the years and some Old Testament, but this has just been a great time to walk with Jesus, to know him, and to find out all the details of his intricate plan to save us. It's amazing, amazing. But the only thing I miss right now is being together with you. Uh, looks like it may be close to starting back up, so I'll have to talk to you about that possibly in a couple weeks. Um, those who want to show up, if you feel you can, then I'd like to invite you. Um, if not, I we understand completely. Um, these are, this is uh, different something we've never faced before right <clears throat> being quarantined so let's get into it Luke chapter 20 verse 9 through 18 just to get you up to speed this is the last week of Jesus and we are currently at day Wednesday and Jesus is teaching in the temple. <clears throat> On Monday, he entered into Jerusalem in a triumphal entry and made his way all the way to the temple. And then that night, he went back to Bethany. And then the next morning on Tuesday, he came in, cleansed the temple. Uh, it was desecrated by money changers and the whole priestly mob mafia that controlled that area and uh, just made a disgrace of what God had established uh, with the sacrificial system in the temple so Jesus cleaned it out physically threw them out and they did not return now he has an empty temple where the people could come in now and a lot of the leaders were there as well and he was going to teach you know Tuesday Wednesday Thursday and now we're went on Wednesday and he's there teaching to all the people um, approximately 10,000 in that area <clears throat> and it, Mark says as he's teaching he's weaving around the colonnades and uh, walking among the people and the leaders are there trying to trap him um, they're going to try three times in these days to trap him by either making him blaspheme God uh, blaspheme Rome say something ill about Caesar or the Roman Empire or possibly get him to uh, to apparently break the law in front of everyone um, to go against the law of God. Um, so they're going to try to trap him. Last week we talked about them uh, trying to get him to tell them by what authority he teaches. Um, by what authority who gave him the right to cleanse the temple. He never asked anyone. He just came in and did it. Uh, as well as teaching. They are upset because he has stepped on their religious system. And they know who he is. We're going to, this is revealed today. They, they know, they know better. And so Jesus now, in a response, to his authority being questioned now is going to give a parable it's a story that will illuminate to everyone 
what is happening. Jesus, by telling, making up this story, which is actual a sweeping history of Israel, as well as his role in it, and the role of the leaders there, he's going to give this parable. And so let's read through it. Um, Luke 20, verse 9. He went to the people, or he, he went on to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard. He rented it to some farmers and went away for a long time. At harvest time, he sent a servant to the tenants so they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty handed. So the owner sent another servant. But that one they also beat and treated shamefully and sent away empty-handed. So he sent still a third, and they wounded him and threw him out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my son, whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir, they said. Let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When the people heard this, they said, God forbid! But Jesus looked directly at them and asked, Then, what is the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? Everyone who falls on that stone will be bro broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. The teachers of the law and the chief priest look for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them. But they were afraid of the people. So this is what's keeping the leaders at bay, is the people. They are positive toward Jesus at this point. And as we have just seen with Jesus when they questioned him about his authority, he posed the question a counter question to them bringing in John the Baptist of saying what authority did John the Baptist have and of course the religious leaders rejected John the Baptist but they couldn't say that because the people loved John the Baptist they considered him a prophet so the leaders were afraid of of this mass mob. Um, so they did not want to come right out and grab and arrest Jesus at this time. It wasn't his time. So, Jesus made up this parable, but there's truth to it. And Matthew and Mark also give a synoptic version. They tell this same parable with just minor differences and I'll, and I'll bring those out here. This parable is, is common especially, especially for an agrarian culture as, as Israel. Um, we have an owner who has this land more than likely it was a hillside um, most of the flat land was used for crops, but the hills were used, <clears throat> they, they would terrace them or make them uh, stair-stepped to make them flat, easier to work on, and they would plant vineyards across the hillsides. In Matthew's account, he says that they, that Jesus had said that the owner had put a hedge around it, uh, put a wine press in it, and also put a tower there. Um, uh, I mean, a complete, thorough 
perfect vineyard that was created and this is common and it was also very common to rent out to tenants to contract farmers because the owner wasn't going to be present he said he planted the crop and then he left and he left the land for these tenants to take care of um, <clears throat> more than likely they had predetermined or came to grips with they settled on a price that the owner would say I want this much for the land and then you can have anything above it and this is really a great opportunity for them because it for the workers renting because they have the freedom to do what they want with uh, their time and uh, have the privilege and also responsibility to work the land. So Luke says the owner stays away a long time. In other words, he, he leaves after the crop is planted and he possibly li lives in a far off town or a foreign place outside of Israel. And so he goes and he sends a slave or a doulos, that's the Greek word for it, a servant or a worker to come back in to get some of the pr produce from the vineyard, to get his share of the crop. <clears throat> Up to this point, there's nothing really unusual about this story. This is what is to be expected. It was part of the predetermined contract. But Jesus in being, in being the great storyteller comes to the point, that moment of outrage, of shock, of shameful conduct in his parables. And we've seen that already in the book of Luke. Back in Luke chapter 10, if you remember, when there was a wounded man laying alongside the road and a priest came by and also a Levite later both walked right on by. They just walked right on by. And, and that wasn't so much shocking but the third person that came by was a Samaritan. And the Samaritan took care of this wounded man. And Jesus just built him up of saying this this man just showed amazing grace and that was the shocker that a dirty filthy Samaritan whom the Jews hated was the hero of the story that was the shocker and then Luke Luke 15 we had the parable of the sons and the one son went and squandered all all of his inheritance and then came to that point where he said, ah, I've got to go back to the Father. I'm just going to beg to be put in his service so I'll have something to eat. And so he goes back. And, and Jesus telling the story, everybody's thinking, oh, this son, is he's disgraced his father. He's just wretched, and he's coming back to his father. His father's going to deal with him sternly. And then Jesus' story takes a twist. It says, but while that son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. It's like, what? What? He should be filled with anger. But Jesus says, no, his, his father is filled with compassion for his lost son. And he ran to his son. Do you remember that? He, he girded up his, his robe and exposed his leg and took off running for his son. It's like, this is shameful. This is... Oh. It's disgusting in the eyes of the Israeli culture, the Jewish culture, for this father to run and... Um, when he got to his son, he threw his arms around him and kissed him. And, and this was the shocking moment of this story. Um, when 
he starts lavishing this lost son with the ring and the robe and the sandals. It's like, what? What is going on? So Jesus has this way. And so he's, he's got everybody thinking, wow, this owner, this poor owner, we're on his side. He sent slave after uh, servant after servant, and these mean, awful, dirty tenants are killing the servants. And so the listeners knew these tenants were wrong, that they were ungrateful, they were wicked, and they were downright criminal. And why? Not to pay the owner what was due and send him back with nothing and beat his slaves? This is crazy. But the owner sent servants to these people. And the first one, they beat him. Sent him back with nothing. The second slave, they beat him and insulted him. Sent him back with nothing. The third, they wounded him and cast him out. Uh, the Greek word there is tremidzo. Uh, traumatizo, which we, we get the word traumatized from. They, they wounded him so bad he was traumatized by this event. Um, and, and he was cast out um, and, and headed back with nothing. Um, if you look at the, the accounts of Matthew and Mark that they give of this parable, Jesus says, that there were more servants besides the three. Luke just gives three. But Matthew and Mark said that he sent many others, and some of, the, some of them they beat, some they killed, and still some they stoned. So this is taking it complete, complete murder and abuse to an extreme level. And the owner, this is the amazing thing, um, the owner could have shown up after the first slave and extracted vengeance. Um, even after the second one and say, what is going on? But the owner is extremely patient here, giving opportunity again and again for these tenants to do what was right. But verse 13, the owner says, what shall I do? And of course, everybody listening to the story is like, you should come down them with holy, come down on them with holy vengeance and, and slaughter these people. And the question, of course, was asked because Jesus is getting the people rallying around the owner. And finally the owner says, look, I'm going to try one more time. I'm going to send my beloved son. And Matthew says, last of all, I will send only my one and only beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. In other words, he's saying, they should be ashamed to show any disrespect. This is my son. And it's a reasonable thought. But. He headed off. To get. To speak. To the tenants. Verse 14 it says. Before the son said anything. They knew who he was. They dialogued about this. They knew who exactly who this person was. It was the son. And they schemed, saying, this is the heir. Let's, let's kill him and take what's his. So this is premeditated murder, knowing full well who he is. And they did as they planned. They threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Now, this is completely 
outrageous. And this parable was designed to bring the people in and show them that this is unacceptable activity that is almost to a degree pagan. And Jesus masterfully made the people completely identify with the owner and they understood the injustice and wickedness of the tenants. And so the story just sucked them right in. And then he, Jesus asked, what will the owner do to them? Now, in the account of Luke, he asked the question and he answers it. What, what then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? The response is, he will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. So two things. Now, in the other accounts of Matthew and Mark, Jesus poses the people that question, and the people respond by saying, they will bring the wretches to a wretched end, and then the owner will rent out the vineyard to proper people who will pay him the proceeds at the end of the season. So in other words, he will destroy them and give the land to others who will take care of that land. Now, the people find themselves in the story at this point that is playing out before them. Because of their response in verse at the end of verse 16. It says, when the people heard this, they said, God forbid. No, no, no. This is an emphatic, may it never be. Um, I don't know if you remember in Romans chapter 6 where Paul there, he's, he's, he's posing questions in the book of Romans um, in chapter 6 uh, in verse 1 where he has just been discussing the, the grace of God that, that pours out and forgives people who are in Christ. And we are free indeed with no condemnation. And then he says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? Shall, shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? Shall we keep on sinning just so God keeps revealing grace all the time? And Paul responds, God forbid, no way, absolutely not. We, how shall we who are dead to sin live any longer in a lifestyle of sin? Do you not know that you were baptized into Jesus Christ? You were also baptized into his death. It's like, no, we have been born again into a new life, born out of a sin, sinful lifestyle and In the past, we could do nothing but sin. Now we have been brought out. We're not to take advantage of God's grace. He's like, no, you, you still will sin, and God's grace is there for you when you do sin, but you do not continue to sin in order for God's grace to compound. And, G and Paul used that emphatic, no, by no we means necessary should that happen. And that's what the people are saying here. As they realize what Jesus is saying, that this story is about them and him. Because when they heard it, the Greek word there is akuo, which we get the word acoustic from. They they heard it and they comprehended it. They understood what this is about. They're grasping it. And now they're understanding, well, wait a minute, the son. We do not want the son killed, nor do we want the vineyard to be destroyed, <laughs> or the, the, the tenants, the, the people of the land be destroyed in no way no and they panicked about this they understood it 
completely. They're like, no, no, we will not kill the son, and, and we will not destroy the tenants at all. Now, they knew what this story was about because it is actually being drawn from Isaiah 5. In the opening five verses of Isaiah chapter 5, it's saying that God has established Israel, his people. They were chosen, they were an elect people, and they were flourishing. <clears throat> and it says God planted a vineyard. Israel is that vineyard. I will sing for the one I love a song about its vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it of stones, and he planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a pr wine press as well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now I want you to understand, this, this is exactly what Matthew has said, that in Jesus' parable, that there was a vineyard with a watchtower and a wine press. And of course, this means there's a, there's a tower there, and that, that talks about Israel is God's nation. He is their vineyard in this tower. He's there. His presence is there protecting it, protecting this nation. And there's a wine press that speaks of the sacrifices there that is satisfying factory to the owner that the uh, the grapes will be pressed there and the fruit will be yielded there and um, and it says here that it was planted with the choices vines this is talking about the people themselves that they were the noblest of people ever to exist in this world. They were the, the Jewish nation, Jewish race. But the story goes on here. In verse 3, Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could I have, could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I look for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I'm going to do to this vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall, it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thro thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. So God says, I'm going to judge this vineyard because it is not producing good fruit. And in verse 26, I mean, read through this on your own. Um, but by the time you get to verse 26, it says, He lifts up a banner for the distant nations. He whistles for those at the ends of the earth. Here they are. Here they come, swift and speedily. He's like, the nation Israel has turned away from me so far that I need to shake them and wake them and the only way I can do it is by bringing, bringing a wicked nation in. And so he whistles for them. Get in here and shake up my people. And Isaiah is talking about the Babylonian Empire coming in that is going to put Israel in captivity and actually destroy the nation. Uh, destroy the temple, destroy everything, the nation, um, except for the exiled people that go into the nation. But anyway, it happens. His vineyard. <clears throat> you can look. You can read also Jeremiah two twenty one that that gives the same illustration of a vineyard, um, and that goes in oh, great detail, very great detail about the people and how they sought after other gods and, and rejected God and they became the bad berries, the, the bad fruit. And 
And so we ask, who are the vine growers then? Who are the tenants? Well, we know the, they would be the stewards, stewards of Israel. Those who were supposed to take care of the spiritual needs of the people. That would have been the kings, the priests, all the way through Israel's history. All those who were responsible, accountable to God, to lead the people. And this is a 2,000 year expanse of Israel's history, all the way from Abraham to the time of Christ. Because the owner has been away this whole time, he doesn't come back until he comes in the form of his son. So we know the story talks about the son, it's Jesus. At the appropriate time, at the appropriate season. But before that, God sends his servants. He sends the true prophets all through their history. And these prophets were sent to Israel to return the nation back to the Lord. All the way back to the time of Moses. All the way up to John the Baptist. Turn to God and be obedient. Reject sin. Reject the foreign gods. Reject evil. That has been their message. Repent and come to the Lord. And how were those prophets treated? They were beaten. They were treated with shame. They were cast out. They were killed. And they were stoned. Exactly how Jesus had explained it as the servants here. Uh, we've talked about this already. Jesus has brought up the prophets before. And he's just to remind you that I Isaiah himself, as a prophet, was sawed in half. He's the one referred to in Hebrews 11 37. Um, Jeremiah was constantly mistreated. He was thrown in a pit. Tradition says that he was stoned to death. Ezekiel faced the same hostility and treatment. Amos fled for his life. Zechariah was rejected and stoned. So there's one thing that was sure, especially true of the story Jesus tells. The leaders of Israel were always consistent. They always were in opposition to God and the servants they sent. And if you remember back in Luke 11, Jesus talked about this. He said, Woe to you, verse 47, Woe to you because you build tombs for the prophets, and it was your ancestors who killed them. So you testify that you approve of what your ancestors did. They killed the prophets and you build their tombs. Because of this, God in his wisdom said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some whom they will kill and others they will persecute. Therefore, from this generation will be held responsible for the blood of all the prophets that has been shed since the beginning of the world, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, this generation will be held responsible for it all. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who, who were sent to you. Do you remember that? They love to kill their prophets. That's their history. Slaughter the prophets. And it's nothing new at all. And Jesus back in Luke chapter 6 in the Beatitudes he says, Blessed are you when people hate 
you. When they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for, that, for joy because great is your reward in heaven. For that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. So it's, it's going to continue on, Jesus is saying. Um, they killed the prophets in the past. The leadership did. And they're going to continue to kill the leadership. So the story is a parable, but it's pronouncing the truth. What has happened. And we know that God has been so patient. This is the amazing thing that stands out to me. The, the amount of time that God is patient sending a prophet, another, 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 and then finally sending his son. And they reject him. And they want to kill him also. And the amazing thing is, just like these tenants... The tenants knew who the son was, and they conspired to kill him. These Pharisees, these leaders during Jesus' time, they know who he is. They never, ever questioned any of the evidence he showed. Shown, they have never denied any of his miracles. They even say that he speaks the true word of God. But they could not believe in him. They love their power, their position, and the money. And it was a hard issue. They had rejected him as the Messiah because they saw him as a threat to what they had. <clears throat> and so Jesus predicts his death here of saying they're going to they're going to throw him out of the vineyard vineyard and he's saying they're going to crucify me outside the city in other words i will be rejected by the nation like i said when the people understood it they realized what they had said when they said, destroy the wretched vine growers and give it to someone else, they said, no, wait, wait, no. We, we just condemned our own religion and our own nation. We want to take it back. We don't want to kill the son. But what Jesus is saying is, it's too late. It's over. It's over. The nation has come to an end. And Jesus has already given the divine judgment when he said back in chapter 13, Look, your house is left to you desolate. And just in Luke 19, he talked about the very day, Because you've rejected me, from now on the truth will be hidden from your eyes. And the day will come when your enemies will build an embankment against you and circle you, hem you in on every side, and they will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls, and they will not leave one stone on another. Why? Because you did not recognize the time of God's visitation. You did not recognize me. Therefore, I'm telling you, the nation of Israel will be judged. And he predicts the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans. We, you should know this by heart now. That 40 years later, 70 AD, the Romans are going to wipe out Israel. Remove the temple. Destroy the temple. No stone left on another. And over a million Jews would die. And Jesus is telling them this is going to happen. And so Christians are warned to get out of the city because they believe Jesus. But the people understand this whole story that Jesus has given and they panic. 
And they're saying, we want you to be our Messiah. We want you to be the Messiah. And this is the same people who a couple days later will be screaming, crucify him, crucify him. And the people will follow their leaders right into judgment, destruction, and hell. Okay, we're not done with this parable um, because I want to discuss the part about the vineyard will be given to others. And I asked the quest, question, who are they? Who is this vineyard going to be given to? Well, we could say the church and be done with it, but no, it's, it's, there's a lot more to this. Um, so we're going to be looking at that and about the stone the builders rejected, what that all means. And it's amazing. <clears throat> and so I hope you understand a little more in depth um, what is really obvious in this parable. Um, I'm, I'm just going to, at the end here, something really came out to me as I studied this parable. Something that really I, I pulled from it that, that has happened um, that I see in my own life and, and experience and, and it's really it's the patience of God how God has been patient with Israel he sends them over and over messages, sends them warnings, sends them the truth through the prophets, through the messengers of God. And they reject and reject and reject and finally reject the Son. And this is such an illustration I see as people here today that we approach with the message. We are prophets in a sense of we're prophets, priests, and kings through Christ to give the gospel, the good news to people. And God has given everyone a certain amount of time where he's like, okay, the message is going to come to you. You are held responsible for the seeds that are sown. Remember, we, we Jesus has talked about the sower of seeds and a person has so much time in their life to accept the truth. And they hear the message over and over about Jesus. And God sends different messages. And so I try to be that person of throwing the seed and I, I know you are, are as, as well that we are uh, ministers of God's reconciliation to, to tell people about God sending Christ for them. And so, ever since I was a young Christian and um, God had urged me to talk to this one specific person that I worked with back in Indianapolis. Um, he's like, give him the gospel, give him the gospel. And, and I, was, I was afraid. I didn't know how to approach this person. And it went on for a while, and then finally one day I went to work. And to my dismay, this person had been killed in uh, a farming accident and it's like God I, I, you put it on my heart to talk to this man about you and I did not do it and I said at that time I, I will never ever miss an opportunity again I will I will tell whoever I come across if you urge me as well as just I wanted a nature of habit to ask them, you know, 
who do you say Christ is? Or do you understand who he is? How do you get to heaven? And to put forth the gospel. And, and I think about people time after time after time that hear. And there's another case that comes to mind where I had an opportunity to talk to someone, a friend. I had two opportunities. And, I mean, not a lot of exposure with this person, but I had opportunity, people were around, and they had give me a simple question. They, they had given kind of open statement, kind of iffy about God, and just kind of left it hang there. And it's like, wow, th what an opportunity. And so I'm just getting ready to speak. And somebody interrupts. and cuts me off. It's like, and, and I can't, that, that moment was lost. And I, and I so wanted to tell them about Christ at that point. And I saw that they were somewhat open. But it happened again, where I was, I was ready to tell them about Christ, and I was interrupted. And it, it is like being in a baseball game, and, and you've got the pitcher standing there, and you're up to bat, and you're ready for this lobbed slow ball coming and it's like oh it's just hanging there and you're just ready to crank on that ball and as you go to swing the bat somebody's holding the bat and the ball goes by and the reason I'm saying this is that person passed away And the person holding the bat was the person that interrupted me speaking to this man. And after that person I wanted to talk to died. Um, the person who was holding my bat was re really sad about the loss, as we all are. But it's like I, I was even more taken back by Lord. Why wasn't I able to talk to them? I, I that's that's the hard concept. I I wanted to, but I wasn't allowed. And so we have the chance, we have an opportunity for the rest of our life to give the gospel. And I know those opportunities are impression, are to impress us for the rest of our life that um, we're to give the good news. Because people's lives depend on it. And I'm hoping those people people that don't understand the truth will come to know um, the truth because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life he died for us may we continue to proclaim him Father thank you for your word Thank you for the grace gift you have given us. Thank you for your patience that through our past we've heard you through people send the message to us. And we heard it, we heard it, we heard it. And then one day we finally heard it, understood it, and you saved us. You, you regenerated us. You made us a new creation in Christ. And you made your word knowable to us. 
And Father, I ask that you use us more, that you give us a spirit of boldness to tell people this type of parable to them that um, God has spoken to tell them, look, God has been trying to get your attention over and over and over and over. And He wants you to come to Him because He's given His Son for you, a free grace gift. And our life is short. It is so short. Please accept Him. Please. I beg of you. I plead with you to know Jesus the one. So Father, I pray that those opportunities may come our way and that people's heart would be open, that their their hearts would be fertile soil. And Father, I, I think that I understand now we are the scatters, the gathers of your kingdom. We are the ones that scatter the seed and gather in those who would come with, to you. Whereas those people who interrupt, who, who don't want to hear the message, they are the ones who scatter, that keep people away from you. Father, I pray that we have great opportunity to reach those for Christ. And that those who are scattering will one day turn and see you and stop gathering or scattering and start gathering for you father i ask this in jesus name amen